Our next presenter is Annabella Hillier. Let's give it up. Thank you. Studies major pursuing honors and minoring in business administration. He will be graduating at the end of this quarter. Throughout her time here at UW, she served on the editorial board for Field Notes, that's the College of the Environment's undergraduate journal. And after graduation, she will be moving to New York City to pursue a career in environmental policy through government relations work at a renewable energy company. Annabella, the title of Annabella's presentation is Not Everyone is an Environmentalist, Negotiation Strategies for Passing Plastics Policy. Her host organization was Oceana, where her site supervisors were Ben Indicknap and Sarah Holtznick. Her faculty advisor for the campus was John Meyer of the University of Washington's College of the Environment. Let's give it up for Annabella. Consider this spread from Life Magazine in 1955. Throwaway living, disposable items cut down on household chores. Sounds great, I hate chores. But the appeal of single-use plastics, they're designed to be discarded after seconds of use, is why the equivalent of two garbage trucks full of plastic enter the ocean every minute. This plastic will permeate the marine environment for 500 years, threatening ocean animals and exposing humanity to microplastic. Plastic reduction policies can help mitigate this crisis. However, in order for legislators to vote yes on this legislation, we need support from the constituents they respond to. My research focused on how to promote plastic reduction in Washington state. I sought to answer the following question. What are the best practices for garnering support and engaging stakeholders in plastic policy efforts in Washington? I interned at Oceana, the largest NGO solely dedicated to protecting and restoring our oceans. I supported House Bill 1085 and the RAP Act by testifying, writing letters to publications, creating a petition, and designing an amplification toolkit. I also analyzed stakeholder testimonies, conducted expert interviews, and research literature. House Bill 1085 passed, requiring water bottle refill stations and new construction, banning hotel mini toiletries, and banning styrofoam docks. The RAP Act did not pass, but aimed to shift the cost of producing plastic from consumers to producers. One thing I learned as I watched an act incentivizing reusables fail is that not everyone is an environmentalist. Stakeholders know plastic is an environmental hazard, but this is outweighed by the consequences of disrupting present production. My testimony analysis revealed the most prevalent barrier to plastic loss, cost. When waste management testifies about a proposed policy's economic burden, followed by an NGO discussing environmental effects, it's two different conversations. My interviewees, who are community engagement experts from multiple environmental organizations, indicated that it is most effective to speak the language of the opposition, even if you have to equate the environment to its monetary value. For example, a representative from the Washington Hospitality Association stated in her testimony that House Bill 1085 would financially burden lodging establishments. However, the installation of bulk dispensers can be viewed as a one-time cost compared to the continual purchase of mini toiletries. Similarly, a central opposing argument of the RAP Act is that reusables are more expensive than virgin plastic. How about the $100 million of potentially reusable materials we send to Washington landfills each year? So how can organizations tailor their arguments to reach all audiences, not just environmentalists? Through cross-organizational collaboration, messages can be differentiated to reach multiple groups leading to the identification of stakeholder allies. Each week, Oceana met with the steering committee to discuss legislative updates and strategize plans of action so that all positives of plastics policy are covered. They coordinated testimonies and fact sheets to include the many ways to discuss plastics and recycling. Some examples of messaging include litter reduction, creating green economy jobs, creating markets for reusables, and cutting, and cutting carbon emissions. We can then identify stakeholder allies, like the International Bottled Water Association, who actually supported the RAP Act, as corporation-funded recycling satisfies their need for high-quality recycled plastic. If we can get the plastic water bottle guys on board, we can truly get anyone. We must find reasons to support plastic reduction that appeal to the groups that are actually responsible for making effective changes. 
we have to tell the hotel operators that buying bulk dispensers can be cheaper in the long run than the continual purchase of thousands of mini shampoos. We have to remind plastic packaging producers that there's an estimated $100 million worth of re potentially reusable materials heading to watch in landfills each year. Even though these arguments are not what moves an environmentalist into action, not all of us are environmentalists. For some people, not necessarily the people in this room, this photo is not gonna provoke a significant lifestyle change. It is imperative to advertise the variety of positives afforded by plastic reduction, or this poster from the 1950s will continue to ring true. Luckily, I know a lot of people and organizations who are working hard to ensure that we will live in a world where environmental and human health are prioritized over throwaway living one policy victory at a time. I would like to thank my parents and my grandmother, Susie, for supporting my education for two decades, um, for my site supervisors, my fellow Oceana intern, Jessica Day, I cannot do this without you, my faculty advisor, POE faculty, who have dedicated their careers to equipping all of us with the knowledge to tackle environmental issues, and of course, my wonderful best friends who came to support me tonight. All right, do we have any questions for Annabella? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, that's definitely a tough question, but in environment, oh, sorry, she asked if it falls more on the, if the responsibility of making changes falls more on producers or consumers. In environment classes, we learn about the iron cage of consumerism, which basically means that consumers are constrained by walking into a store and seeing what's available. If there's not single use plastics on the shelves, then no one's going to buy them. And so I think while consumers do play a role by voting with their dollar, it comes ultimately to the fact that this stuff is being created for consumers to buy. And if it wasn't created before, no one's going to buy it, um, which where I think the role of policy comes in. I love bioplastics and compostable materials because it provides the same experience as a single use plastic, but way less of an impact. Great. Uh, yes. You mentioned that a lot of the company pushback for um, reducing reuse or reducing reducing single use plastic was like the cost of it all. But what was like when you were going and lobbying for the um, different bills? What was the actual politicians take? Like, what were they like? What were their excuses voting down the bill? Um, I think just ultimate lack of. Oh, sorry. I think um, she just asked what the politicians take was as many of the stakeholders were pushing back against the bill because of cost. Um, I think that there was such an overwhelming dissupport from people in the waste industry, from waste management, from major, major plastic producers that, and they were saying the bill wasn't feasible, that there's too much of an administrative burden, the timeline is too abrupt, things like that, and that they were ultimately pushed by all these people to not support the bill. And it also helps that these people have a lot of money and a lot of resources and the people that are opposing um, have a lot of say and influence towards the politicians. Wait, time for one more question. Yes. How would you deal with uh, people like the oil industry that are like, uh, interested in the plastics and materials? Does it matter? Uh, so we asked how to deal with the oil in industry who are more in interested in the production of plastic. Um, well, that's a tough question. I think that the oil industry cares about the production of plastic because of the amount of money that people pay for plastic. So I think that is rooted in cost. In addition to creating oil, they're also able to create this material that wraps every single thing that we see in a grocery store. So of course they're continue, gonna continue to create it if people are gonna buy it and pay money for it and put money in their pockets. Um, so to deal with them, <laughs> I think that it's a definitely a large battle, but a combination of policy and also um, just consumer support for not buying those materials anymore. Great. Thank you so much.